You may remain seated. Our sermon text for our meditation this morning is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 16, which was just read moments ago, and I'll be working our way through it during the sermon. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear children of the light, in our world today, there are no shortage of bad examples when it comes to handling, dealing with money. There's no limit to the amount of mishandling, defrauding, cheating, and downright stealing that goes on in the world around us. All you have to do is turn on the news for a little bit, open your newspaper, and you're bound to find someone who was caught doing one of those things, mishandling their money and cheating and stealing other people. Maybe you've even been a victim of someone else's dirty underhandedness and lost some money yourself, maybe in a a transaction somewhere. Money is so often associated with unjust means and gotten by unjust means that we've even come up with a nickname for it. We call it filthy lucre from time to time. And since money is often such a dirty and unrighteous thing, you might expect that finances and religion would stay in completely separate parts of our lives and completely avoid one another. It would feel like they belong as far apart as possible in opposite areas of your life. And even though, as Christians, you you earn your money from an honest living, it may seem to many Christians that things like taking an offering in church and and talking about money and finances in church can seem a little bit like that ugly, dirty, filthy lucre peeking its head into these sacred walls. But Jesus makes it very clear, here and in other parts of God's word as well, that faith and finances are very closely related to each other. In fact, the way that we use our money, the way that we use all of our blessings that God gives to us has a direct effect on our faith and our salvation. And Jesus instructs us today to use our money and every one of the blessings that God gives to us, every one of his blessings at our disposal to invest with him. Investing with God is worth all of the effort because when we invest with him, he pays back in eternal dividends. Now, I have long considered this parable of the shrewd manager to be one of the more difficult of Jesus' parables to understand. So if you're sitting here wondering today, why is Jesus telling us to be like this dishonest cheater? You're not alone. You're not the only person feeling that way. Many explanations have been spun out there to try to explain why what this man did wasn't so bad. You know, people would, might explain that um, the Jews often used to overcharge people because they weren't allowed by their religion to charge interest, so they would overcharge people to begin with, and so maybe this manager was just simply taking that extra charge off and really being more honest. But let's face it. Look at what Jesus calls this man in verse 8. Jesus called him dishonest. What this man did was wrong. He stole. He defrauded money from his master for his own personal benefit and didn't even fight the charge that he had been dishonest and, and squandering his master's wealth before. He wanted to make sure that when he lost his job, he'd have a place to go and friends to watch, watch out after him. But even though this man did something that was wrong, there is still something here that the Lord wants us to learn from this scoundrel. And the first thing that we need to know about this parable is that the people in this parable aren't who we normally expect them to be. From Jesus' other parables about masters and their servants, most often the master is the Lord himself, God in heaven or Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and the servant is is us, believers who follow him and belong to him. But that wouldn't make sense in this parable. We can't defraud God out of his blessings. 
We don't keep tabs on other people's blessings and then release to them and, and give them more of what people owe God. And if the master were the Lord, if this master in the story were our God in heaven, we certainly wouldn't want to follow the example of someone who's about to be tossed out where in other parables Jesus tells us there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this parable is different from many of the other parables that Jesus tells us, and the characters aren't who we might expect them to be. In this story, Jesus is just giving us an example of some of the dishonest and shrewd dealings that happen, especially with money, in the world around us. The heading from your NIV Bible calls this the parable of the shrewd manager and uses that word shrewd, which I think is still even an attempt to make it sound like what he did wasn't necessarily wrong. But again, Jesus calls him dishonest. And if we look in the original language, the original word that Jesus used there to describe that man was unrighteous. What he did was, frankly, an outright sin. He was not a believer or a follower of Jesus. He is not someone that Jesus would have us take on as a role model. And even the master in the story appears to be a very ungodly man himself. He didn't care so much that what his servant did was immoral and wrong. Instead, he praised this servant, this manager, because he acted shrewdly because he used everything at his disposal to forward himself and his agenda and achieve his goal. And that's what Jesus wants us to learn from this story. That is what Jesus would have us do as his followers, to use everything that God has given us at our disposal to achieve our number one goal as followers of Christ. The people of this world around us, Jesus tells us, are very shrewd with using their money and all of their possessions that they have to serve their ultimate goals. If that goal is making money, you will see people that will stop at nothing to make an extra dollar. Business owners who will work tirelessly to, to squeeze pennies out of their product. And while I hate to bring politics into it, it seems like a avid application here that if the goal of someone is to achieve an elected position, you may be surprised and absolutely horrified at the lengths to which someone will go to achieve an upper hand or find some, some sordid detail about their competition that would give them an edge in the election. And if the people around us are willing to put so much effort and so much of their uh, resources into these goals that, frankly, money and power and such, are, they're here today and tomorrow they're gone, tomorrow they're given to someone else. Shouldn't we, as Christians, be willing to put absolutely everything we have into the goal of following our Savior? into those righteous and eternal treasures that God has in store for us? You and I could stand to take a page from this dishonest manager to use everything that we have for that goal of enjoying eternity with our Savior and doing everything we can to bring as many people around us to that eternal joy as possible. But Jesus says we haven't been as shrewd in our dealings with the blessings that God has given us to benefit and to work toward that goal. We're not guilty of putting in the same effort. Let me say that differently. We're guilty of not putting in the same effort, of not being willing to take risks and step out of our comfort zone and hungering for a return on our investment. We often give our hard-earned hard money into the offering plate and then just kind of sign off on it from there. That's all God would have us do, almost, as if. Just plopping the money on his plate and saying, there, Lord, now you take care of it. And that's it. 
we should be hungering and thirsting to hear what's being done, what our leaders are doing with the offerings that we give and making sure that we are making the best decisions possible to use that to reach as many people as we can. We should be hungering and thirsting to hear about God's work that's going on in your name with your own offerings that you gave to the Lord as a gift to him in places like Cameroon and, and Malawi and Hong Kong and all of the blessings that God is pouring out there. We should be hungering and thirsting, but so often we're apathetic and we sit back and feel like we've done our share. What more is there for us to do? In our world around us, there are plenty of opportunities, places for us to pray about, like the new mission starts that our church has started up in places like Texas and Colorado and South Carolina and in our own community right here in our own area and in our congregation. We should be as thrifty and shrewd as the world around us to make the most of every penny that God blesses us with and every day of our lives that he gives to us so that the gospel can be proclaimed as broadly and freely as possible. Now, of course, we can't use our money or any of the other blessings that God has given us to buy eternity for us or for anyone else. No price that we could ever pile up would ever amount to what it cost to bring one sinner to heaven, let alone you or me, and not only that, but your way has already been paid for, 100%. Not with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, your Savior, the, the Lamb, without blemish or defect. Because of him, your home in heaven is guaranteed. Eternal dwellings are being prepared for you in heaven right now. Jesus tells us, I go there to prepare a place for you without any down payment, without any monthly mortgage or f closing costs, indeed without any effort on your own part, you have in your name a perfect home in heaven awaiting for your arrival. But just because your eternity is already bought and paid for, that doesn't mean that the eternal blessings that you have become worthless. First of all, God tells us that these are blessings he gives to us to take care of us, to provide for our needs and the needs of our family. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that God will fill our lives with great blessings so that we have everything that we need. He provides a roof over your head by giving you money or a family who helps to pay for it. He gives you skills and abilities that you can use for gainful employment so that you can buy the food that you need, the clothes that you need to wear, and gas for your car. But he also promises that he will give us more than that. More than what we need to care, care for ourselves. Paul goes on to say, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. God pours out his blessings on us with a purpose so that we take those blessings that, we have given to, that he has given to us and we invest them back with him so that he will bring about blessings that last for us for eternity. We have a new purpose, a purpose that people around us who don't know Jesus as their Savior would not know and understand. They may think that you're crazy for giving your hard-earned blessings to someone else and giving them back to the Lord and investing with him. They don't see the return on the investment that you and I have been given. You and I have a new purpose in life. There's a man named David Blanchard. He's been called one of the most ingenious thieves ever. And he had just this knack, a, a skill, to be able to walk into a secure place and, and figure out where the loopholes in that security system were. He pulled off heists during his time that, were, that would have put Mission Impossible to shame. I mean, spending months staking out a bank as it was being built 
and uh, sifting through the security system to find its weaknesses and even going so far as to parachute down into a guarded compound to steal a loot and make off with it. From 1998 to 2007, David Blanchard eluded the cops, eluded all the authorities. Most of his thefts were small enough that nobody was really going to pursue him that hard. But he ended up amassing millions of dollars worth of cash and other stolen goods. Finally, his luck ran out, and the cops caught up to him. And when they were interrogating him, David Blanchard had a bit of a a change of heart. He began to open up and revealed his secrets of how he pulled off these heists to the cops, so much so that he enabled the cops to go back to the banks and show them how to improve their security system so other thieves like David Blanchard wouldn't be breaking in and stealing. Now this man had a new purpose. Now he was using this skill, these blessings that he had to help others rather than hurt them. You and I have been given talents and abilities and blessings that God has given us to serve a purpose. Before we knew God as our Lord and Savior, the only purpose that we had was ourselves. The only one we wanted to serve was ourselves and those who love us. But now, through our Savior's death on the cross and faith in our hearts, God has given us new life and new purposes to use to put these gifts and blessings to work. We don't lay them aside because of God's great promises to us. We make use of them more and more because of the important goal we have to serve our new great and glorious purpose, to share this good news with others so that they may enjoy the blessedness with us of our eternal home. Faith and finances do belong very closely linked to one another. Jesus tells us that one of them will always serve the other. Which one will rule in our lives? Will we serve money and its sordid purposes? Or will we use our money and all of our other blessings to serve our Lord, to strive for the goals that he has given us in faith, and to invest with our God for eternal rewards? May the Lord bless us to follow him, to serve him with everything we have and everything we are every day of our lives. Amen. Please stand. To God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and lives in inapproachable light, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.